Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Lynn Teo, the CMO at Northwestern Mutual. Lynn's responsible for the brand, the marketing, the research, the insights, the events, and everything in between for this $34 billion revenue business. Lynn, it's so great to see you here at CES. Thanks so much for joining today. Well, thank you for having me, Matt. Absolutely. So, Lynn, I was going through your background, and I saw that you started your career on the agency side. And I spent uh, many years on the, uh, running an agency myself, and I know that it is stressful, but you do learn a lot, and it brings a lot of benefits. When you look okay. back at that part of your career, what are some of the takeaways that you have that you think help prepare you for the role you have today? You know what? I have to say it helped me engage in transformation initiatives uh, with no fear, um, no playbooks, um, because I think when you're on the agency side, and I would I would categorize consulting in that same vein, yeah. is you service are being business. service business. Yeah. That's right. You're given a very small amount of time to understand the business that you're trying to solve a problem for. And you have to add value as a consultant, as an agency person. You're brought in because they couldn't solve the problem right. in-house quickly enough. And so you've got to bring it. So I think that my agency has have trained my ability to problem solve, to not be afraid of transformation, but to always look at the exciting side of innovating a solution. I think training your ability to change, training your ability to solve a problem and not just operate in the status quo is a very, very, um, it's just an invaluable skill to have. Yeah. So I think it's it served me well. Yeah, and you also get to jump around from brand to brand. Yeah. So while you have to kind of learn quickly, you also get the you know the novelty of going from working on automotive to financial services yes. to tech, and that can keep it fresh. And you can also take learnings from one industry and Absolutely. extract it to something else. Absolutely, and I would encourage any any young upstart in marketing to really consider formative years, five, eight years in the consulting or the digital or agency. I wouldn't even say digital agency. It's any agency. You know, to your point, I, I, I reflect on my 10 years. I've had an interesting career. Matt, it's been what I call the 5-10-10. Okay. So five years at Bell Labs, which was the days before Google got really big. Yeah. And then 10 years consulting digital agencies, agencies, uh -huh. and then 10 client side. So when I reflect on those 10 years in agencies, I tackle advertising, publishing, automotive, software, e-commerce, travel, banking, more, I mean, dizzying. Right. Right. And I think if you're a, a learner and you love understanding the business context, I just think that's a wonderful way for anyone wants to be a CMO or a senior marketing leader to start their careers on the yeah. agency side. So when you say go to the client side, I mean, it is interesting because you're on the other side of the table and it kind of yes. flips. What's different about being a client that maybe you didn't expect when you joined and all of a sudden now you're on the side that's doing the spending that has the revenue responsibility, et cetera. Right. How is that a sh shift for you? Yep. Well, one of the biggest differences, I think, being on client versus agency side is one, you hold the budgets. Yeah. You have a PL. and l um, You are accountable uh, to provide results to your enterprise. You know, for a lot of publicly traded companies, it's quarterly investor earnings reports. Um, you know, if for me in a private company, we still have to do our QBRs, our quarterly business reviews. So in many ways, you will know if your strategies are having the desired business impact. Right. So in many ways, like you can't you can run, but you can't hide. Right, you can't hide anywhere. Because if it's not working, it's on you right. to pivot. Because if not, the enterprise is, is wasting resources. So and you're stuck with the consequences of your decision where, absolutely. you know, if, if you run a campaign and you're on the agency side, yeah, maybe your agency loses the account, but presumably you'd work on another account or... That's right. But whatever decisions you make, it's part of your role and it you have to... That's the biggest difference. Yeah. And I think you need to revel in it and you need to gain energy from it. Um, not be afraid of something that you thought was going to work, didn't work. Um, but I think the key is how are you able to pivot, right? And and I just think that being on, on the client side, you also are able to carry an understanding of how teams need to be motivated on the agency side, right? Yeah. And I tell people that clients, you deserve the agency you get 
because it all depends on how good of a client so you true. are. So true. Isn't it? Well, ultimately, it's like if you expect people to spend late nights away from their family yes. and, and, and really put in that extra effort and think about your business when they're going for a run at the park, they need to like you and they need to feel respected. Yes. And throughout my side on the agency world, I've had clients that I'd run through a wall through because I wanted to make them proud. That's and right. And I, I had other clients where it's like, they're not treating me good. They're not treating my people good. They're treating me like a vendor they don't respect. And like, I really don't care about their business or their career. That's right. Like, you don't care about them yeah, as humans. Right. Because we're only, we're human beings. That's and right. I say the same also with pitches. It's like, yes. I'll never forget. I worked on a pitch. And it was like over like, I want to say it was like Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. It was for a big technology client. And to this day, I've never found out if I won the pitch or not. And that was 15 years ago. And you put your heart and soul. They don't even tell you if you win or not. It's like, so we're spending, you know, all these hours and you can't take 30 seconds or anything. I'll say thanks so much for going another direction. I just think ultimately you need to treat people with respect. It's a long road. Yes. And, and yes. ultimately you get from other people what you give to them. That you said that so well, yeah. Matt. Um, Thank you. And I feel sorry for you. Oh, it's okay. I'm kind we, of over it. <laughs> no, but you, but I think that for me, um, it really affects me yeah. as as just like a a human. Yeah, it's exactly. Like you don't do that to someone, right? Um, when I think about the first RFP I ran, and this was two gigs ago, right? Uh -huh. Not my current role. Um, and I remember we had six agencies at the table, and we really were very thorough in assessing them, but. When we landed on our decision, Matt, we took the time to call every single one of them. And we said, we are willing to give you a half hour or 45 minute slot so that you you and I can, feedback. can, we can yeah. talk very candidly about what we liked and what we didn't. And, you know, I, I take that very seriously because I was on the other side and everything you said about late nights and yeah. you're pouring your heart and soul into it. I think that's the least we can do as clients. But I still remember one gentleman telling me, he's like, Lynn, no one that we've worked with has actually taken the time. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, it is and unique that you guys do that. We did that. And and even though we didn't pick them, um, that individual is in my very special circle of friends right, right. now. And I think that for it's me, a long road too. Who it's knows? a long road. Uh, other opportunities will undoubtedly come up again in the future. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. So I, I definitely think that my being from an agency before helped me appreciate what does it take to get the best work out of people. I see my agencies as extensions of my team. And in fact, I love it when they come together and they ideate. And you have to be that kind of leader that is able to bring the best out of people, regardless of where they are yeah. and where they work. Right, right. So I think for me that's- Agency, collaboration. Exactly. All that. Exactly. And what- what do you look for in a new, like if a new partner, a vendor, an agency wants to do business with you yes. on the client side? Yes. Like, obviously, I'm sure you don't like being cold called and spammed and yes. bugged. Who does? Yes. What does work? Um, I've always wanted to ask this of a CMO in terms of to give advice to some of our listeners and how to, you know, get in front of somebody like you and how to add value and ultimately be able to do business with you. Great question. Um, I think that you have to earn your right to open up a conversation with a, a CMO, sure. right? So, uh, you know, I've had multiple meet, meet and greets at CES. Some of them are 15 minute quick pulse meet and greets. And the, For the one- the purpose of seeing who to work with? Yes, or, uh -huh. or there is an agency that feels like they have something unique to offer. And I, I think you should always show up having done some homework yeah. about the client. Because you're giving up your time at a minimum, they should give something back for your time, which is, Doing some work, adding some value. Adding some value, yeah. right? And I see that as part and parcel of life, right? So like if you're going to find, if you're going to get someone to spend time with you, you need to show that you're interested yeah. in that particular potential client. Yeah. Um, so that for me goes a long way. Um, and having a point of view about what is working or what isn't working from any publicly uh, facing asset, you know, right. could be a website. Corporate earnings call, you name it. That's a, right. A and quote I, that you gave in a podcast, anything like that. Exactly. And it doesn't matter if it's not 100% accurate. But what that tells me is that there is critical thinking. There is some level of assessment that's been done. Um, and it, it, it really is a teaser um, in terms of telling me, how would this person work with me and my team? Yeah. So I, I, I just think you can see it's, the intellectual plane that they're playing at. That's how does, right. How, how high level are they thinking? How tactical are they? How truly 
um, comprehensive? Do they understand your business and what you're trying to accomplish? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I and I always believe that everyone does. Everyone has something to offer, and so. You know, I can go into a conversation with someone who's fresh from college or someone who's an intern, right? And if they demonstrate this drive and hunger to do something for my brand and they put in the time, I will give them the and time. And if they have aptitude and they're good, then they have a shot. And that's, that's right. I think, like, you know, I get so many emails, people want to do business or even potential employees. And I would agree 99% of them just, it's like you're copying, pasting my name for somebody else's. And you didn't take any time. That's right. So it's like you want me to take 15 minutes and grab coffee with you again, but you couldn't even write an email or do any research, et cetera. And I don't think a lot of I think a lot of people lack patience or they, you know, that they just think, oh, I should be able to just will my way through, but you do have to earn it. And you earning earn it is it. you know, that's how it kind of should be. And I think I agree. It's, it's a good message for I think people in business to understand that. Yeah. But that also creates sort of like a meritocracy where if you can you know, break through, then there's a lot of opportunity out there. That's exactly right. Because like I said, it, it is a taster of how this agency partner is going to work with you. Yeah. And so, and I, in looking at your background, I also saw that you've worked all around the world, right? Yeah. You've worked. So, to, I, which I, I kind of, I envy, you know, I never got the chance to work overseas and, um, you know, I love traveling. And tell me about that experience and how you've been able to adapt to local cultures yes. and local business norms in, in new markets as you've yep. been able to. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it is my background, having grown up in a multicultural, multiracial Where'd you city grow up? state. I grew up in Singapore. Okay. Um, and I was there for my undergrad years. And so growing up in a multicultural society, you understand how to flex. Yeah. And you understand that not everyone re views the world in the same way. And so I think that's been my default. When I, in any situation I step into, I'm intellectually curious about what makes one category of people different than another. Sure. Uh, and so you kind of walk in with no preconceived notions. And maybe because I grew up in a multiracial country, I have an innate understanding of, you know, maybe social conventions or cultural differences in how people are with each other, preferences in communication. So I think that's been very helpful um, as I go into a new market or a new geography and understand, all right, well, what would it take to connect? And I think the core of it is believing that research and insights serve as the, the basic kernel of either good advertising, good marketing. And I would even say, you know, I've, I've kind of coined the term unmarketing. I think the best marketing is when you're not trying to overtly market. Absolutely. But you're there to tell the person, I understand your situation. I understand you. I, and then I understand how my brand can add value yeah. to you. Yeah. What What do you think about when you wake up in the morning and where does my brand fit in? How can I help? That's right. It's ultimately the first way of, and that's really shift the, I think, paradigm for brands from advertising, which is pushing my unique selling proposition to content, which That's is right. adding value and trying to enter people's lives contextually where they yeah. feel like there's value added and they will put your brand in the consideration set. That's right. It's either you entertain them, you educate them, yeah. you inform them, That's you exactly tell them right. something that maybe they didn't know. So you're adding value. Yeah. Yeah. So... Totally get it. So let's talk about your current role at uh, Northwestern Mutual. So um, very big company, uh, big financial services organization. Yep. What is it, if you met somebody um, at a you know cocktail hour and they said, what does your company do? How would you describe it? I would describe it as a 166-year-old financially sound uh, financial services company that had its roots in insurance. But over the you know last forty years or so, we've really branched into full holistic integrated financial planning, and very few people know this. But the combination of those two things, we call them risk products and investment products, they work in tandem. Insurance and wealth management. That's exactly yeah. right. And the beauty of Northwestern Mutual is we manufacture our risk products. So um, it's how on it, balance sheet. Uh, not so much on the balance sheet, but how these products work to pay you dividends over time while while still giving you the protection and like coverage. Whole, like whole life insurance policies. That's right. Right. That's right. We have whole life. We have term life. We have disability. Right. We have long-term care. Very few people know this, but the um, investments that you make, and maybe I shouldn't be using the term investment, but we pay dividends. Yeah. 
And so at the time of when you have to make a claim, right, you are being given whatever your insured amount is. But what people don't know is that you actually have dividends that are paid out as the years roll. And you can borrow against the cash value as well. That's exactly a lot of, a lot of right. young people especially don't understand the value of whole life insurance as a sound As a mechanism. Yeah. But it, it is a set of instruments and tools that work together. And when you think about the market volatility that we're seeing, right, the days when crypto was, you know, what everyone was running after. Yeah. But rising interest rates. Rising so interest much, right? rates, right? But the philosophy here is that at the time that you retire, you want to be able to protect your assets, right? You don't want to be subject to the fluctuations the market, of the market. Yeah. And that's the reason why the combination of those two things give you the trajectory of growth, but also give you the stability of what you need to live. Yeah. So there is a whole science and a whole set of algorithms that go along that calculation. And so that would be kind of a, a large part of my description, which is holistic financial planning. And the only way that our products and services reach the consumer and our clients is through our financial advisors. They are, in my opinion, they're on the front line, front the line but they're also second to none. And when I think about the history of Northwestern Mutual, we have 8,000 financial advisors who truly, truly care about their clients' financial futures. You hear stories of being, people being wheeled into the emergency room and the call that they want to make is to their financial advisor. To make sure their family is taken care of. That's right. Yeah. And those relationships have been built over tens of years. Our average relationship with our advisors is 42 years with the company is 42 years. Wow. So that's that's pretty phenomenal. So I think it's a sound, financially uh, strong company that has stood the test of time. Let me get my facts straight. But since 1872, we have not failed to pay a dividend. Think about all the life events. Yeah. Think about all the world events that have happened. The global financial crisis. Crisis. Yeah. Everything. Yes. Yep. Everything. Wars. Yep. Depression. Yeah. Very few companies can can do that. And yeah. we're, we're about the long term. We're not the flash in the pan, that moment in time. Yeah. We're about discipline, long term, holistic financial planning. Extremely proud to be holding holding up the brand yeah. you know, for Northwestern Mutual. So as CMO, obviously, you want to steward the brand, but ultimately is about driving growth of the business, I would imagine. Yes. And a big part of that's acquiring new customers. Yes. Right. So yes. It, if the average customers with um, your company for over 40 years. Yes. Um, you know, the entry points aren't every day when you're when a consumer would be ready to yeah. switch. Life yes. insurance is something that, from my experience, is something that a lot of people push off. Yes. It's just like, to, I don't That's need to right. do it today. I'm gonna, so, yes. and, and I don't know if your entry points more on the wealth management side or the life insurance side, but, you know, how are you going about driving growth, getting new customers? How are you translating that great story mm -hmm. that you just talked about from Northwestern Mutual? to the millennial generation and younger people who are first starting on yes. their financial journey? Fantastic question. And we actually are very focused on Gen Z mm -hmm. um, as we think about how do we start them young? Yeah. Right? Because if you- Best time to start. Best time. Yeah. The Power you, of compound interest. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. Right? And I and I tell people that, like, don't make the mis mistake I made, yeah. which was I realized, you know, much later in right. life. And there are all sorts of cultural reasons why- we form belief systems about money and saving. But I go back to the 20-somethings who are maybe in their first job, getting married, having a baby, having a first uh, corporate job, first 401k, oh, buy a home. All those buy a home. Yeah. And I, I see our brand, uh, the Northwestern Mutual brand, as being there to provide the guidance, the help, the information that they need to be of service and to be helpful. Um, and maybe the first product could be a disability product because when you're in your 20s, you've got an entire lifetime in front of you. Yeah. You can't afford to be disabled. And yeah. maybe that first product is a disability product. But the way we connect to new uh, clients is, I call it a segment approach, right? So what are the needs of this particular segment? These are folks who are getting established. We have people who are maybe a further along. They might be sandwich generation where they have you know, parents and children. But I think for Gen Z, it's about how do you make yourself relevant and helpful? So as they age up and they 
they um, they enter different phases of their life, you become that default brand that they think of. That's where the holistic planning starts to kick in because you would have established by then a relationship with your financial advisor. Sure. So I think the beauty of it is I think um, Gen Z expects you to understand them and Gen Z doesn't want to be sold. Gen Z wants to be engaged. So how do you engage them? Well, if you look at our presence on TikTok, you'll see that we've done pretty well okay. in terms of the financial services industry. We're one of the leading financial services presences on TikTok. Um, if you look at Instagram, we're also very much attuned to what are some of the visual elements that serve that platform well. So we launched, uh, for the great realization, we launched a campaign on Pinterest. Highly visual. You want to visualize your life, whether you love traveling, you're remodeling your kitchen. So you have to think very creatively about how you will intersect with someone's yeah, life. Their passion points, things passion they care points. about, and where does your services fit in. That's exactly yeah. right. The other area that we're very hyper-focused on is partnerships. Because partnerships open up new avenues, new audiences. And you get borrowed brand equity of other brands that might be more relevant in certain areas as That's well. That's right. Yeah. So you may have heard about the Brewer sponsorship. So we went into a Jersey Patch sponsorship with the Brewers, mm -hmm. Milwaukee Brewers. Yep. We're two uh, historical legacy brands based in Milwaukee. But the interesting thing is that that, that team is going to travel all over the U.S., spring training, right? So we we see that as a wonderful way to extend presences in communities where we have financial advisors that will then maybe invite the clients to be part of our brewer's experience. And so we think very creatively about partnerships. We think about what other affinities can we uh, um, can we identify, financial literacy being one of, one of them, uh, women, Sustain Action for Racial Equity, SARE, S-A-R-E. That's a program that's been launched at Northwestern Mutual for about three plus years after the murder of George Floyd. We said, what can we do to change the conversation around financial inequity in the U.S.? And we went all in, right down to suppliers. Who are we using as our suppliers? Um, funding Black founders in our accelerator fund, right? So these are all things that I think Gen Z finds highly resonant because there's a social impact yeah. component of it. So again, I think about these partnerships. And you're trying to make the world a better place along Absolutely. the way. Absolutely. Yeah. In, in the most authentic way because we firmly believe in it. And NM Northwestern Mutual believes that we can change the conversation around the inequity of of our financial lives, right. you know, when we think about Hispanics and how they've grown in, in their population in the U.S., we think about the LGBTQ community, right? So women, I mean, I think the, the key here is being highly attuned to communities that need us. Yeah. And how can we serve? And you can't go after Gen Z without having a diverse approach because by nature, a diverse demographic. That's right. Yeah. That's so, right. and when you talk about TikTok, you know, and your ability to engage, there was probably a lot of learning that you had to undertake to understand like, this is a new platform, it's a new environment. Yes. And TikTok specifically is a platform where you really need to be able to fit into the form factor of That's how right. people seek out and consume content there. That's right. So what does a process like that look like in an institution like yours, which is a you know, it's it's a it's it's been around a long time. That's so right. So you have to now all of a sudden adapt. That's right. And I give my social media team a ton of credit yeah. for this. They lean into what does it take for the post to actually show up on people's feeds? Yeah. Because there is a science behind that, Absolutely. the algorithm. But what's the right content to put in front of people? So you have to entertain, but you also have to draw brand relevance, like what it is that we do that we believe is going to be helpful. So little clips about you know what's helpful, little tips. Uh, we're also going, going to be doing much more work in the video, long-form video space as I look at YouTube. Yeah, I'm hearing that a lot. Yeah. Yes, because I think there is a hunger for that kind of information. And Instead of someone, um, a non-financial services entity doling out that information, I think we have 8,000 plus financial advisors who have all the right licenses to be able to give out the right And you, uh, advice. you guys can underwrite it because you, you have presumably a business case on the back end of it if you can 
win more customers and, That's right. and build your business. That's right. We have a chief investment officer who has a, a point of view about our philosophy. Um, and we have product experts in the entire array of our portfolio. So we feel really good about being at the forefront of that because you know the information has been vetted. Yeah, it comes from us. Absolutely. And how are you able to land the plane? So you're creating this engaging content, right. you're entertaining, you're educating people. Yes. But then I, I would imagine eventually you need to start to collect leads or do something. Yes. So you know, down the line, yes. you are paying it off. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I tell my, my teams that, you know, the problem with advertising that stays at the emotional side of things is I said, you can emote till the cows come home. Right. If the person's not going to take action, then we wouldn't have done our job. Right. And if it's Coca-Cola and they're seeing it every day on the shelves, it's different because That's right. they're gonna they're going food shopping every day. But yours is a little bit different. You That's right. A little more intentional about That's yeah. right. And for us the start of the lead is when someone raises their hand and says, I would really like to talk to a financial advisor. Right. Um, and we have a matching algorithm on our site where, you know, it's informed by uh, the demographic, the geographical area. So we have a little bit of a secret sauce yeah. behind that matching process. It's, you, you are matchmaking, you're creating a relationship, and that relationship is the work That's for right. that relationship to thrive and then be a 40-year customer one day. Exactly. And yeah. it might just start with a conversation of course. that doesn't convert uh, tomorrow. It doesn't convert in three months. But we have found that a year tends to be a pretty reasonable amount of time where you're kind of giving giving the person time and space to really learn about build us trust. and build trust because it's a different kind of product. We're not selling sneakers. Um, and we also say that in the space of insurance, you'll hear this often, that they'll say that our product is actually sold, not bought. Yeah. But I say Makes that sense. because the selling process has to be so attuned to what that person needs. Um, it can't be a hot push. It has to come from deep understanding of that particular person, his or her family structure. How many children do they have? How did they grow up? So the questions that our financial advisors ask are what we know the differentiating factor. The questions you ask then lead to the answers that we provide, but are you asking the right questions? And I've always believed that Northwestern Mutual Advisors are so well-trained and so diligent in kind of their understanding of tax laws and all the instruments and vehicles that they actually know which questions to ask. Yeah, totally makes sense. So we're at CES here in Las Vegas, and it's all about innovation and what's next. And yes. in your category in financial services, there's been just a slew of new fintech Absolutely. innovation yes also on the wealth management front there's companies like wealthfront there's platforms like robin hood where people can invest on their own how do you see these sorts of innovations which gen z does gravitate towards what's yes. new is that an area that northwestern mutual is also looking at in terms of obviously you always want the human touch in a relationship yes. but is there an element of technology that can enter the fray that can also help you Contemporize a little bit for oh, this new absolutely. generation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a client experience team, and that's where all of our engineering, digital product, tech teams operate out of. Our mobile app is something that we put a lot of time and investment in. We believe that that mobile app serves as the daily pulse, yeah. that daily engagement, whether it's a you know what your spend spending patterns look like. Um, you know, I think that for us is a doorway. So that and for us, people expect that now. People from expect it. Partners, yeah, absolutely. But what also again, I go back to your value prop. Our value prop is integrated, holistic financial planning. So when you power up our apps, right? We're innovating in terms of how do you give people this full picture of the elements in that portfolio that they actually don't have? And if you start out with a disability product, there would be a, a logical next adjacent product that you complete should complete the thinking, puzzle. Complete the puzzle. Yeah. And if you think about the power of AI and the tons of data that we sit on top of, Right. And again, knowing about the, the customer, where they're on the life cycle, what their needs are, you can feed them. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and make no mistake, we protect our clients' data, um, you know, with tremendous uh, sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're able to then do is be able to aggregate some of those patterns that you're seeing. So we have a, a data science and analytics team, the DSA team, that feeds into a lot of um, the propensity to buy a second product and if so, what that product is. And I think about marketing as showing up at the right moment in time. Yeah. 
uh, we're also thinking about innovations in the service space. So when someone calls and makes a claim, right? I mean, I think about that moment as being a moment of truth for the brand because you have to be empathetic, but you also have to follow through with your promises that you're going to pay this, this claim out. And I also think about how we can innovate in terms of what then happens to that claim. What's the best way to invest in that claim? Do you need all of it all at the same time? And so I think about the innovations we make in the services side of our business. It's all, it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's I think I'm, I'm in, a, in an industry that is at the cutting edge, but also with the breadth and the longevity of having done this for a Right, you don't want to be bleeding years. edge and, and lose the principles of what made the company right. great. And a lot of what remained true 50 years ago in terms of compound interest and saving and, and risk management still exists today. Exactly, and right. expertise. I put a lot of weight behind yeah, the absolutely. expertise that we've gained over those 160 plus years. And so I believe that Northwestern Mutual has a unique value proposition of the human combined with the technology. Yeah, awesome. So wrapping up here, Lynn, um, you know, you obviously have a lot of passion for what you're doing. It's clear that you're in the right role um, at the right time right now. When you look back at your career, what are some of the things that you think that you did right and decisions that you made along the way that sort of enabled you to one day end up in the CMO seat, which is right. a place where many marketers want to end up in yeah. one day. It's such a prominent institution. Yep, yep. You know what? I think what's propelled me is I've just been innately curious. Yeah, you can tell. Curious. I'm talking to you. I just want to learn. I don't take anything at face value. I don't believe that things stay static. And I lean in because I believe that that's the only way for a business to stay relevant. Yeah. Um, I lean in into insights. I lean into what people need. So perhaps it's that combination of me starting my career as a usability engineer a human factors engineer. It says that right there in my title at yeah. Bell Labs. So I think I started out with this very deep empathy for people and what people need. And then I kind of translated that into a career in digital products and digital native and being digital first, but never um, saying no to traditional media. And I think that's important because it's the synthesis of all of it that helps you be a a good CMO. I tell people that, you know, I don't have I don't have statements that go, oh, if it's traditional, it's bad. If it's digital, it's good. No, I want to think about how I can orchestrate these things in the best possible way um, and to bring a systems thinking into my philosophy of marketing. So that has served me well. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that listeners will maybe take away something here and say, continue being curious. Absolutely. And is there a mantra that you live by, you were to sum it up, uh, the way that you look at your career? I would say um, find a way to get there. Yeah. And that's because I grew up in Singapore and uh, I had big dreams about coming to New York and I had to figure out a way to get there. And I think that mantra has served me well. Whatever obstacles I might meet, right? perseverance, yeah. hard work, um, yeah, things don't come easy, but I believe that if you set your heart and your mind to it, that you can achieve, you can, you can achieve a lot. Yeah, that's for sure. We're going to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Lynn. This has been awesome. I cannot wait for our listeners to hear about your journey and the great work you're doing at Northwestern Mutual. So well, thank wonderful. you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Matt. On behalf of Susan and Adwee team, thanks again to Lynn Teo, CMO of Northwestern Mutual, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. We're here live at CS in Las Vegas, and we'll see everyone soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A-Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.